Grief can be a raging fire, fueled by love that has been ripped away and the fury that now takes its place. It's a fire that can be soothed and die over time, but for some, it can fan into a deathly inferno. In Mandy, the blazing fire of grief consumes minds, bodies, souls, and worlds. Writer and director Panos Cosmatos' 2018 film centers on Red and Mandy, played by Nicolas Cage and Andrea Riseborough, a couple living a quiet life in the rural Shadow Mountains. But their peace is brutally broken when they're targeted by Jeremiah Sand and his cult, the Children of the New Dawn. Jeremiah kills Mandy after she rejects his brainwashing seduction attempts and leaves Red for dead. Soon, Red's rampage of revenge will physically destroy the Children of the New Dawn and spiritually bring about his own world to ruin. Sliced into three segments, each delineated by their heavy metal style artwork, Mandy is a film nearly overwhelming in its onslaught of style, but underneath it all, Cosmatos layers numerous ideas into this tale of revenge. Religious exploitation, cosmic fantasy, psychedelic folk versus the rise of heavy metal, true creativity versus cults of personality. But in each of these elements lies a story of world-destroying grief and rage in the wake of the senseless loss of great love. Whether through brutal slaughter or planet-consuming cosmic annihilation, what else can be done but to destroy those responsible? Mandy is a film that takes the primal scream of rage, the black hole of grief, the volcanic eruption of revenge, and changes them from subtext to text. The world in Cosmato's film becomes warped and melted by the molten core of loss at its center, with Cage's Red simultaneously being its blood-drenched figure of vengeance and its greatest victim. Yet Cosmato's film doesn't revel in its violence. Using its slow and methodical first half to establish the love between its two main characters before their lives are torn apart by senseless lust and violence, Mandy is shaped into a tragedy, its revenge an expression of sorrow, as cinematographer Benjamin Loeb paints the film's worlds in hues of blood red and astral purple, we descend into hell with our grim hero, never knowing whether we're fighting our way out or digging ourselves in deeper until the end. Like Cosmato's previous film, the micro-budgeted acid sci-fi Beyond the Black Rainbow, Mandy has all the trappings of a midnight movie but transcends them through experience and theme. Take the bare-bones outline of this sparsely plotted film. Happy Couple is targeted by a group of zealots. Man goes on a path of revenge after the woman he loves is killed. The ideas bring up images of low-budget 70s and 80s fare like Rolling Thunder, I Spit on Your Grave, or about five dozen Charles Bronson flicks. And Red's late film Unflinching Forest Rampage is deliberately styled after Jason Voorhees of Friday the 13th. The setting is even called Crystal Lake. <laughs> Unlike those films, Mandy doesn't revel in the righteousness of revenge or the cheap thrills of violence. No, Mandy is an expression of planet-devouring myth, a film whose first half of quiet, psychedelic love hangs heavily over its second half of unrelenting carnage. Likewise, the spirit of Mandy is ever-present, appropriate for a film not only named after her, but whose final segment bears her name. Riseboro's titular character is obsessed with elaborate fantasy worlds that echo the heavy metal albums and fantasy novels that debuted in its 1983 time period. These metal fantasies and the interplanetary myth of the Roman god Jupiter are superimposed on its everyday America setting because Mandy's worldview is the spiritual focal point of its characters. Jovan warrior sent forth from the eye of the storm. Does the supernatural exist within Cosmato's film? Or are these visions of celestial bodies and mythical foes the projections of a soul fatally racked with grief? In the aftermath of losing a loved one, whether through death or otherwise, it's easy to see them in everything. Being in love colors life, going so far as to give life meaning for some who have lost everything else. When they're gone, all that's left are echoes of the one you love. As shown in flashback near the very end, the moment when Red and Mandy first met was the moment where the entire world changed. Brilliantly colored lights wash over the two, emanating from Mandy and illustrating how Loeb and Cosmato's cinematic choices definitively ground the film within her spirit. Whether in mind or flesh, Mandy's melancholy and love of fantasy worlds infuse Red's quest. 
making her an inextricable part of his world after her death. Mandy was his everything. Now, she is Red's only thing. Like the briefly mentioned Galactus, it's planets. grief can also consume your world. Those fantasy elements exert themselves more and more as the film continues, with both weapons and aesthetics reflecting heavy metal fantasy. Red's crossbow, the Reaper, hints at his warrior past. His new weapon, the Beast, a cruel battle axe that embodies his all-consuming anger. As far as the weapons go, said Cosmatos in an interview with RogerEbert.com, I wanted the weapon that he forges himself to crystallize, like a manifestation of his grief and insanity, and not like a real object. More like a mythical artifact that he sort of pulls out of his soul in a way. Mandy's fantasy world becomes overlaid on the blue-collar setting until the two form a psychedelic hybrid. Red's world has forever changed. There's no going back. And in his anguish, he not only destroys his enemies physically, he destroys himself spiritually. It's an extreme expression of those who cannot heal when their loved ones die, and a message that is clearly tied to Cosmatos' personal life. Panos is the son of director George P. Cosmatos and sculptor Brigitte Lundberg Cosmatos, who both passed away before Panos had made his first film, Beyond the Black Rainbow. That film heavily deals with the absence of parental figures and the holes they leave in the lives of children, who must learn to shape their own worlds without guidance. It's a cold and distantly psychedelic film less concerned about the process of loss and more about making sense of life. In Mandy, Cosmatos intensely focuses on the burning heart of grief in the immediate aftermath of death. One is about control and one is primal. One is sterile and one is kind of teeming with life. Maybe it's two sides of myself. After tragedy, it can seem like intense spiritual agony, the kind that haunts your dreams and washes over you from head to toe when you wake, will never subside. In Mandy, Cosmatos spills that experience from his heart with no end in sight, as Red gives into burning rage that Mandy may have wanted him to deny if she were still alive. While the writer-director suffuses the first half of his film with a creeping dread, a sense of inevitable violence and loss to come, long, languid passages meditate on the quiet, wounded love of Mandy and Red. Both Cage and Riseboro's performances hint at dark, painful pasts. Their love is a balm for old wounds, their existence together more than enough to make life worth living. Often, a cosmic light filters over them. Their intimate conversation regarding the planets reflects the massive totality of the cosmos. This shorthand shows us how these two lovers are meant to encapsulate so much more than the relative simplicity of their story may suggest at first. And Cosmatos frames Mandy as the center of Red's universe, which soon becomes the center of the film's entire universe. Her image fills the frame, often most in focus, with Red orbiting around her. He is in awe of her unique, beautiful soul, dangerous and kind, wounded and powerful all at once. There's a feeling of inevitable tragedy to the couple's life together, souls destined to burn in the fire that Mandy feels spiritually drawn toward. Yet the intersection of Jeremiah Sand and his cult feels like a car crash. No one asked for this. No one wanted it. The toxicity of the Charles Manson-like Sand simply sees a woman and, in his emasculated, self-inflated sense of glory, decides she is his for the taking. I need you to get me that girl I saw. Mandy's final act of self-defiance, laughing in the face of self-righteousness, places her spirit in greater control of this reality, as seen in Red's animated dreams of her in a fantasy world. In the wake of Mandy's murder, Red's life and soon his sanity become unmoored, with Cosmatos blurring the lines between grief-stricken outlook and supernatural fantasy. Where does one begin and one end? It's impossible to say, as the aftermath of Mandy's death and Red's psychotic agony never come to a close. They carry on forever, a grim outlook on how impossible it is for some to move beyond tragedy. Much like how the late Johan Johansson's final score blends muscular, raging metal with sorrowful synths to create a hypnotic musical world, grief and rage, fantasy and reality have become intertwined to the point of being forever inseparable. Cosmatos frames Mandy's death in the similar slow-motion, hypnotic lens given to his most mythic of scenes. Here, it's used to highlight the horrific nature of it all and Red's helplessness without fetishizing such a tragic, senseless death. All the sorrow, all the agony, it's on full display and like Cage's character, we can't turn away. 
In the aftermath, Cosmatos returns to unfiltered reality to reconnect us to grief and, most specifically, the indifference of the world. Seen in Mandy's most out-of-left-field creation. Cosmatos allows his viewers to briefly surface for air at multiple points throughout his film, seeing the everyday apathy of the real world in contrast to this nightmarish, slow-motion, hyper-colored vision of unbearable anguish and hellish revenge. The world spins on, no matter how much pain and sorrow you feel. Cheddar Goblin doesn't care about your problems. In its most painful moment, Mandy surfaces from the psychedelia for one long, unbroken shot of red writhing in agony. The wildness of Cage's performance going beyond over-the-top cheese and laying bare a tormented soul. No score, no extreme color grading. It's horrific grief whose internal scream lasts long after the external ones have come to an end. <laughs> These moments are when the film's broken heart connects to the real world, even as its apocalyptic visions begin to escalate. There, there was a muscle. It didn't make any sense. There were bikers and gnarly psychos and <laughs> it's crazy evil the insanity of demonic bikers and fantastical battles and chainsaw duels don't have to make any sense they're pulled from the idea of 1983 rather than the reality for me said cosmatos 1983 is more like a sort of mythical realm that was born when I was a kid and I wasn't allowed to watch horror movies. So I would look at the covers and read the descriptions from the back. When I was creating Beyond the Black Rainbow and, at the same time, this film, I exercised the idea of creating one of these imaginary films. So to me, 1983 is a mythical realm of the imaginary. We are truly beyond the pale as Red undergoes a critical, devastating change along the path to revenge. Initially, Cage's character is screaming, psychotic, wild, and loud in the most Nicolas Cage of ways. You're in my shirt! You're in my shirt! It's the fresh wounds of torment in the early stages of grief. After killing the demon bikers who helped take Mandy, Red consumes a dose of their otherworldly LSD, burning away the last of his humanity in an instant and giving way to a monster. Does Red know what this drug will do? It's possible that this willing consumption is his last act of self-destruction in pursuit of hate and death. You exude a cosmic darkness. After slaying the bikers, Red is largely a Voorhees-like, stalking killer, becoming further and further removed from any semblance of humanity until his final proclamation of godhood over the whining, impotent form of Jeremiah Sand. I am your god now. The astral conflagration is now housed within Red, spiritually in tune with an indifferent, forever burning cosmos of loss and pain. Mandy is his god, Red the demigod, a demigod of wrath, as Cosmatos once put it. Mandy the Galactus who devours worlds, Red the silver surfer who is the harbinger of cosmic destruction. The world as Red once knew it is over. Comforted by visions of Mandy that contrast heavily against his viscera-covered, psychotic grin, we now live in a fantastical world where little of reality remains. There is no future for Red, no life left to return to. The world, inside and out, has been burned to the ground, and in its place are grief and rage-fueled psychedelia. There are many ways past grief, many ways to grow stronger in the face of death, but it is not this film. Cosmatos offers no answers as to how someone can move past heart-wrenching loss in a cold, indifferent universe. Mandy is, at once, a heavy metal tribute to the dead and a self-immolating sacrifice of a senseless world. All that's left is blood and ash.